Now I want to go over some high yield findings and signs that you may see for common conditions on the wards. I will also be going over some common PIMP questions that you may get or questions that I have received during my clerkships uh, in the hopes that it can prepare you for when somebody asks you about them on your clerkships. So first, let's talk about pneumothorax. Here are two pictures of pneumothorax. The one on the left is a normal pneumothorax, and the one on the right is a tension pneumothorax. And there's a few findings you want to look for here. If you look closely here, you can see this white line going across like this. This is called a white visceral pleural line and is one of the signs that you can see in a pneumothorax. Another thing that you can see is that there's an absence of vessel markings past this uh, visceral pleural line, which is another finding of pneumothorax. Here you can see all the vessel markings and you don't see that out here in the periphery. The big thing with pneumothorax is that you want to check if the patient is having a tension pneumothorax, which is a pneumothorax that has enough pressure that it's causing a mediastinal shift. So you can see that the heart is being pushed to one side of the body. This can cause hemodynamic instability and is life-threatening. So the way to tell if a patient is having a tension pneumothorax is to check for any mediastinal shift. Oh, and I almost forgot, one last finding for pneumothorax is what's called a deep sulcus sign. So sometimes you may have a pneumothorax that is very hard to spot, but their uh, costophrenic angle goes like all the way down like this, okay? That is called a deep sulcus sign, and that is another sign of a pneumothorax as well. Next, let's move on to pulmonary embolism. There are two kind of pathognomonic findings that you might be asked about. One of them is called the Hampton's hump. This is a wedge-shaped infarct, which occurs because the area has no perfusion and has infarcted, and now you can see it as a density on the x-ray. The other finding is called the Westermark sign, which is decreased vascularity. So you can see there's a lot of vessels everywhere, and then there's this area right here, which is relatively darker with less uh, vessels, and that's another sign of a pulmonary embolism. However, these two findings are not very sensitive for pulmonary embolism. So in a majority of patients, you will not see these chest x-ray findings. So one question I have is, what is the most common EKG finding of pulmonary embolism? And the answer to that would be sinus tachycardia. And what is the pathognomonic EKG finding of a pulmonary embolism? And that would be the S1, Q3, T3. And so this is something that if somebody asks you what's the most common EKG finding of PE, most people will immediately jump to the S1, Q3, T3. But this is actually not all that common in patients with PE. The most common EKG finding would be sinus tachycardia. So S1, Q3, T3, again, would be this S wave in lead 1, this Q wave in lead 3, and an inverse T wave in lead 3 as well. Next, moving on to aortic dissection, as I mentioned before, the main thing you're looking for here is a widened mediastinum. What is the diagnostic test of choice for aortic dissection? That would be the CT angiogram. And here's an example of a CT angiogram here showing an aortic dissection with a true and false lumen. You have this double lumen appearance. Now let's move on to pericardial fusion. The main finding for a pericardial fusion is what's called a water bottle heart. So again, remember this is fluid surrounding the heart, but it's inside the pericardial sac. If it happens slowly over time, patients can adapt to this and they can have a pretty large pericardial fusion with relatively minor symptoms. But if it happens quickly, then you're concerned for cardiac tamponade, which the body does not compensate for very quickly and can be very dangerous and life-threatening. So again, you can see this water bottle heart. Some people call it a Hershey Kisses sign. Uh, this is indicative of a pericardial effusion. So what is a EKG finding of pericardial effusion? The answer to that would be electrical alternance. And I've depicted that here. You can see alternating QRS complexes of a higher amplitude and lower amplitude. And kind of diffusely, you see this electrical alternance pattern. 
Now, what is a common comorbid condition causing pericardial effusion? Uh, say it's a 20-year-old male who recently had a viral illness and is now presenting with chest pain that is relieved when leaning forward. That would be acute pericarditis. This can often present with pericardial effusion. And what is an EKG finding associated with acute pericarditis? That would be diffuse ST segment elevation, but actually more sensitive and more pathognomonic for acute pericarditis actually is PR segment depression. Okay, so here is an EKG of acute pericarditis. You can kind of see this diffuse uh, ST segment elevation kind of everywhere, you know, you, you see it all throughout. But more indicative, I, it might be a little small in your screen, is these PR segment uh, depressions uh, all throughout as well, especially in lead two. Next, we're going to move on to congestive heart failure. So take a look here. On the left, you have somebody with a CHF exacerbation. You can see that there's kind of bilateral fluffy infiltrates all throughout. There's hyalur fullness with pulmonary vascular congestion. And people will generally describe this as a wet x-ray. And this is a month later when the patient's CHF has improved. Uh, this is relatively, compared to the other one, a dry radiograph compared to their prior x-ray. Here are some common findings that you'll see with CHF that you should know about. Pleural fusions are very common, both within the lung fissures, but also at the costophrenic angles. You can have cephalization of vessels, which basically means the thickness of the vessels going superiorly is more thick than the ones going inferiorly, which is not a normal finding. This is basically because your ventilation is so poor down in the bases because you have all the fluid, so your perfusion actually starts moving towards the superior parts of your lung rather than the inferior parts. So cephalization of vessels, again, that's when the vessels are thicker that are going superiorly than the ones going inferiorly. Uh, curly B lines is another thing. So you'll see these little lines right here, kind of look like this. That is another sign of CHF. And then again, you have cardiomegaly with the increased cardiothoracic ratio of greater than 50%. Another thing I wanted to talk about was pleural effusions. So on the left, you can tell there's pretty clearly an effusion here. Uh, it's a very big one, so it's very easy to see. This is called the meniscus sign. But in this middle one, it may be a little bit harder to appreciate, but we already kind of went over it earlier. You have this costophrenic angle br blunting right here, so here are some small bilateral pleural effusions. A normal chest x-ray on the right shows you how it should look like, which is with the sharp angles right here. So this is one of the most common things that you'll see on the wards. You'll see people with plur pleural effusions. You should be very comfortable identifying this as a pleural effusion. Even though it's small, you can see it's a pretty clear difference compared to a normal chest x-ray. Okay, now let's move on to pneumonia. The most important thing for this is really identifying the location of the pneumonia. I think this is something that people don't really learn about too much, but it's pretty important. So here, you can see this consolidation right here. And the most important thing for location is actually that you need to always have a lateral x-ray in order to really truly know the location of the pneumonia. So here, you can see this consolidation is back here. And this is classified as a left lower lobe pneumonia. And this actually is a sign that you should know about as well. It's called the spine sign. And this is basically saying that on a normal lateral radiograph, the spine should get darker as it goes down. However, if you have the spine get lighter or brighter as you go inferiorly, that's called a positive spine sign and that is concerning for something obscuring the view of the x-ray in this area. So this is important because sometimes on your frontal x-ray, you're not going to see this big pneumonia right here. It might be very difficult to see and you don't really see a pneumonia there, but if you look on the lateral x-ray, you might see a positive spine sign, which would be concerning for uh, a consolidation in that area. We have this pneumonia right here, which is pretty clear to see, but this one I'm going to illustrate a, a common misconception that, oh, this is kind of in the middle of the lung, so it's a middle lobe pneumonia, a right middle lobe pneumonia. Well, that's why you need to have the lateral x-ray. So if you actually look at this one, 
it's a lower lobe pneumonia. So this is a right lower lobe pneumonia. And I'll explain how that's the case with this next picture. Okay. So now we're looking at the left lung. You can see anatomically how these two lungs are, both in the lateral film and in the anterior film. And then this is the right lung here. So that pneumonia that we just saw was located about here. And then the, on the lateral film, it was here. So I'll show you. Here is the density. And if you look, you can see some of the fissures. So this is the upper lobe. This is the middle lobe. And this is the lower lobe. And you can see this density right here. So this is actually a right lower lobe pneumonia, although it's in the superior segment of the lower lobe. Okay. And this is really important because, uh, for example, on the left lung, you could have a density all the way down here, and that's not necessarily a lower lobe pneumonia because that density could be right here in the lingula or the inferior part of the uh, superior lobe. And so this density could be a lower lobe pneumonia, but it could also be an upper lobe pneumonia. You need that lateral x-ray to really figure out where the pneumonia is. One, more, one last example. Uh, here you see a density right here, then you get the lateral x-ray, and you can see that there's a density right here. So this is a right middle lobe pneumonia this time, and that's because you have your different lobes as illustrated like this. Okay, next, let's talk about an opacified hemithorax, which is basically the whole half of the thorax is whited out. Now there's uh, a specific differential for this, and the main way that you can figure out your differential is based on the tracheal deviation, okay? So this trachea is deviating away. You see how this trachea is deviating away from this opacified hemithorax, and the differential for that would be a massive pleural effusion, okay? So that's because there's so much fluid that's in this area that it's pushing your trachea to this side. In this case, however, you have the opacified hemithorax, but you have tracheal deviation towards that side. Okay? So this is towards. The differential for this is atelectasis, which is collapse of the lung, or pneumonectomy, which would be surgical removal of that whole lung. Okay? So because of that, there's an empty space in this area, which is causing... Uh, a tracheal deviation towards that side. And then here, you have no tracheal deviation. The differential for this would be some kind of massive pneumonia or something that would cause this wide-out appearance, but not really cause any pushing of the trachea to one side or the other. Okay, now let's look at some lines and drains. These are very common x-rays to get because after you place an endotracheal tube, an NG tube, a central line, you always get a chest x-ray to confirm that the placement was good. So here you can see this line coming down. It's in the trachea. This is an endotracheal tube. And this is somebody who just most likely recently got intubated. So they're checking to make sure that it's positioned correctly. So the question here is, how to determine ideal endotracheal tube placement? Well, it should be within 5 centimeters of the carina. Um, and you can do a plus or minus 2. So 5 plus or minus 2 centimeters of the carina. So if you look here, you can see the carina branching off like this. I'll just draw it for you. And then you'll just measure the endotracheal tube's distance. And if it's within 5 centimeters of the carina, then it's a well-placed endotracheal tube. Here we have a central line. It's going in from the right internal jugular vein, and it is ending right here. Okay, so here's my question. How to determine ideal central line placement? Well, for this IJ, it should terminate in the superior vena cava. Okay, what is a common complication of central catheter placement, especially for these I IJV lines? The answer to that would be pneumothorax, because you are cutting in and putting the line up here, which can have the apex of the lung here, so it could accidentally get punctured and cause a pneumothorax. And a common complication of removing a central line would be air embolism. So this would be when you're removing the central line. And that's because an air bubble will get in, and the air embolism could go up to the brain and cause a stroke. So that is a very dangerous complication of removing a central catheter. Why is the right IJV central line better than the left IJV central line? The reason for that is mainly because the flow is better. 
So the right IJV kind of has a straight shot to go to the superior vena cava. If you go to the left internal jugular vein, it kind of has to wrap around and go like this. So it can get kinked. The flow could be slower. So IJVs on the right side are generally more preferred compared to IJVs on the left side. This picture right here is depicting an NG tube. You can see that it is terminating past the gastroesophageal junction. So that is good. That is exactly where you want to see it. Um, a few common things that could go wrong is it could go into the trachea and then you would see it tracking down the trachea and coiling up in the lung somewhere or coiling down here somewhere. And the reason you need to get the x-ray is to make sure it's not doing that because if you start tube feeds in somebody with this NG tube in their lung, you're going to give them a massive uh, pneumonia and there will be massive complications from that. Okay, here we have uh, a Dobhoff tube. This is a tube that goes further and is placed into the duodenum, so this is also checking for ideal placement. One way that you can tell the difference between a Dobhoff tube and an NG tube is that the NG tube, you just see this one more opaque area right here, but on a Dobhoff tube, you can see kind of two walls. You can kind of see the inner and outer wall of the Dobhoff tube. One thing I want to say for NG tubes is that NG tubes can be used for feeding and or for suction, whereas Dobhoff tubes are only used for feeding. What is the most common reason for excess drainage of the NG tube? This is a common uh, PIMP question, especially on surgery. And this would be placement into the duodenum. Okay, So if you, your NG tube is going too far and it's going into the duodenum, it's going to be suc suctioning out all the pancreatic secretions and all these other secretions that are happening down there. So if your patient is draining like three liters a day from their NG tube, it's possible that you placed it too far and you should get an x-ray to check. Um, here is another thing. What is the cause of an NG tube coiled in the chest in an adult? So here you can see the NG tube coming down, coming down and then it's coming back up like this. You know it's not in the lungs because it's not tracking down the main stem bronchi after the trachea. And this would be a ruptured diaphragm, which would cause the stomach to be going back up into the lung area. And this is actually still in the stomach, but you're seeing it up in the lung field because the diaphragm is ruptured and the stomach is displaced superiorly.